what's happening out there, friends. And thanks again for joining us here on uh, Corona Safety Bungalow Bunker Expanded Perspectives. Yeah, sure. That's right. That's good, yeah, good yeah, sure. That's, that's right, right, right. It's me. It's Cam. Uh, joining me is the Corona Kid, Kyle Filson, and we are going to have an amazing time today with this crazy stories that we have coming up. What are you talking about? I'm going to be discussing. I have talked about Kentucky. I've talked about Georgia. I'm going to be talking about Nevada. Nevada. Yeah. Well, I heard Nevada is really hurting, you know, because the casinos and stuff all having to be closed. Vegas is insane. It looks like. You look at the pictures of it, it's sad. You can't just, you're not just gambling, like there's no sports to bet on either. So yeah. like even people that are like trying to gamble online, I guess video poker is probably sh taking off. It's probably through the roof. But, the, <clears throat> but playing poker or, or whatever on a computer is completely different than being in the casino. Like well, I've yeah, been you can't get free beer when you're playing poker well, online. not even that. It's the ambiance. Oh no, it's that. Like, you know, like when you go to a baseball game versus watching it on TV. Yeah, I'm look, I'm old. I'd rather just stay at home and watch it on TV. But, but there is something about baseball. being there. Yes. In in person. Ho hockey's another one. On TV it's cool, it's neat to watch, but when you're there live, you feel it. I've same never been to a fight. UFC fight, but I've, I I imagine it's the same way. Like just half of the fun is the ambiance. So I'm not a gambler. It's one advice I, I don't have. I've never been into gambling, but I know that it's got to be way more fun to be there in person than just sitting oh, out for sure. at a monitor, be, right? you know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so, but Nevada. Um, yeah. Also, another place that people, I think when you think about it in your mind, you think of the wrong things. You think about desert, and that's all you think of. I just do. like they do in Texas. They think Texas is all desert. It's not. Neither is Nevada. There's a lot of mountains, you know, forests. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of great hunting in Nevada. Area 51. Yeah, there's all types of things. There's a bunch of wild stuff. Yeah, speaking, wait, speaking of gambling. Sure. You need to tell the folks about pop-up gambling. Oh, the human cockroach. <laughs> the, human. the reason we call him the human cockroach is because you can't kill him. Yeah, he fell down the other day. In fact, we've uh, got to preface this, though. Look, it's been, at, me and Kyle were talking the other day. It's been at least 15 years. Yes. Since, since he, he had, had stroke. his strokes. Mm -hmm. And the doctors, I was there with you the, that day, and the doctors came and told you and your brother and your mother that he would not live through the night and that you had to go. And if you wanted something to say to him, you had to go and say it now. Yeah. And we went and talked to him and hung out with him. Dude, I'm going to cry right now thinking about it because it was a very emotional time for all of us there at that hospital. And they were like, oh, what do you know? A few days later, like, shit, he's, he's coming back, right? Like, what's going on? And then they told you, <laughs> if he hits his head again and he falls and hits his head, it's going to kill him. That's what they said. That's what they said. Engine, engine number nine this week for the human cockroach. <laughs> yeah, he fell again. Uh, this is like the ninth time he's fallen and hit his head severely where he had to go to the hospital. He's fine. He's home. <laughs> he, In fact, he broke cabinet doors. <laughs> he broke cabinet door. April uh, 24th is his actual birthday. So happy birthday to him. He's uh, 69. Yep. Um, yeah, no, he's fine. I talked to my mother this morning. I was like, well, how's he feeling? She's like, other than a slight headache, he feels fine. Um, I think what happened. Him. I think what happened this time is they took him off some seizure medicine, mm -hmm. and uh, a couple months ago, I think he has a small uh, seizure, you, and that's when he loses his balance because he falls, but nobody before. ever sees him actually fall. Well, he was at my house about three years ago, and I actually saw him have a seizure. I had to call the ambulance to my yeah, house. Yeah, I remember you telling me this. As but he was were like, a, yeah. At my house, he was already he was in a lazy boy watching a movie, so it didn't it didn't affect him. He was watching, of course, Predator. Yeah, right. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah, he's doing yeah. good. He's doing good. And what do we call him? The human cockroach, because <laughs> he can't be killed. <laughs> he can't. You can't kill him. He he's just keeps the, on going. I, he'll probably outlive me. <laughs> he's the Terminator's grandfather. He's unstoppable. Yeah, he really is unstoppable and stubborn as ever. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, but we love him, so. It's hilarious. Hope everybody out there is having a good week. I know that we're all still locked at home. I think people are starting to come out a little bit more. You know, yeah. They're trying to, to lift it, at least in some areas. But, well, and uh, the weather's getting nice. It's one thing to be stuck in your house when it's dreary and nasty out, you know, for the end of the, the end of winter. Yeah. But when you're down here in Texas, like, it's been in the 80s the last few days, and sunny, beautiful weather, like beautiful spring weather. And you're not supposed to go anywhere or go do anything, and it gets to wearing on you hard. Yeah, they've lifted the the ban on parks. You can go to the parks, but you can't stay the night. So, like, you can't go camping. You can go visit the park for a couple hours during the day. That sounds crazy, too, doesn't it? Like, why can't I just stay the night? Why can't they make, just like at the Home Depot, where they, like, restrict how many, like, only 50 people can go in at a time? Mm -hmm. Why don't they do that with the camps? Say, look, we're only allowing 
so many people. You have to your tents have to be so many yards apart. Like say you went to Mineral Wells State Park and they said, look, you can only we're only gonna allow forty campers in there, and you have to have your tents at least a hundred yards apart from each other. Yeah, why could you do that? It'd be better than nothing. It would be better than nothing. Yeah, you're, you're stuck right. at home. And uh, the kids aren't in school, so you'd be like, well, they're full today, but yeah. like, let's make a reservation for Thursday. Yeah. Because that's, that's the biggest problem is my kids are just, they're just, there's nothing to do. Yeah. In fact, I think they're doing some kind of uh, Fortnite live stream event or something at home right now. But th- they're doing that because like, <laughs> you can only play the same board game so many times. You can only that's play the same game so many times. You can't go to a movie. You can't go bowling. You can't go play putt-putt or... Or anything. But yeah. anyways, yeah. let's get into some news, folks. This was sent to us by a woman named Ashley from Sydney, Australia. And she says it took place back in 1980. She said, when I was 13, our family moved into a newly built bungalow on a new in a new site called Woodbine in Campbelltown, which is in southwestern, which is a southwestern suburb of Sydney, Australia. It was on what was then farmland, so it was quite remote from the town center. And this new place was nice and modern. Said one night, it was particularly hot, and she had her window open with the curtain flapping in the cool breeze. Now everyone was asleep, and as I laid there, I heard a shuffling noise coming through the hallway. I just assumed it was my mother, and her slippers were dragging on the carpet. I heard the shuffling come into my room, and then it stopped. It felt like someone was staring at me. So I sat up in bed and said, Mom? And what I was looking at wasn't my mom. It was a tall, white, human-like shape with no features around but a light, rounded head. I went under the covers, and I was frozen with fear. I could hardly breathe. After a few minutes, uh, I managed to whisper to my sister in the room across from me, And I got up and I sprinted from my bed all the way to hers and spent the rest of the night in bed with my sister. I told my parents and they tried to ease my fear, but it didn't help when the following week a photo appeared in the local newspaper showing a woman in all white wearing a hat that used to work on the farm we just moved to back in the 1800s. I never forgot what I saw that night or the fear, and I still search for answers. I don't know. Was it a ghost? Was it simply a night terror? Was it an alien? Or was it perhaps my spirit guide? Thanks for all you do. Whoa. Ashley. So that's crazy, right? They're, she's a kid. They move to a new place. And spots the ghost before knowing there was ever something Yeah, like then that later there. in the newspaper, they show a picture uh, of a woman that used to live on that farm. That's, that's awesome. That's what I think she saw, a ghost. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, pretty cool. That's Thanks. really, really cool. Uh, I've got a couple of, a few stories here real quick about Please. some odd UFO sightings. And I think you're going to enjoy this. One of them starts at MW writes, I was fishing the river the other night in 2017 is back when this other night was. And it runs through town sitting on the east side looking west. And there's a three story parking structure. The area is lit up with lights. And when I noticed the light was being blocked out by what looked like the outline of a blimp and about half the size of the parking structure 30 foot above. Then it looked like an oval shape, like it had turned sideways. It had a cloaking device of what I would compare to the movie, you ready for this? Predator. (laughs) Yes. Yep. No sound and moving slowly. I started screaming at this guy who fell asleep fishing, and I mean I was flipping out. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My mind just didn't want to compute. The guy sleeping, of course, thinks I'm a nutcase, and when I started screaming, the UFO stopped, and then it went back west. It went from 12 to 1 o'clock. Now, the background was black, and it looked like Darth Vader's helmet as it faded into darkness. (laughs) I was going crazy, so I emailed the local police department, said I was asking, and, and of course, they wanted to know, could it have been a drone or was it a UFO? And they responded saying that they were no drones in the sky that night. So now, of course, I believe in UFOs, but I wish I had never seen this thing because it has changed my life forever. I would imagine. Yeah. Now, the other one starts. I saw you. This is from DV. I saw a UFO back. Well, before I was around 12 years old. Me and a friend saw it. 
a few thousand feet away, above our heads at tree level. It had multiple colored lights, and it had hovered for only a few minutes. And, of course, my friend and I were both in shock when we saw it. The UFO then veered towards the sky upwards and disappeared in seconds. And since then, I've seen multiple UFOs. Like one time when I was driving a truck in North Carolina, and then another time in Georgia. Now, there it is again, in Georgia, the stuff that I've talked about, right? Right, yeah. And a few times in California on I-10. Goes on to say that I believe that maybe I was visited by these and that they're still kind of keeping tabs on me. So they're easily, like we've talked about before, family bloodlines seem to be abducted. Yes. You could also say that, and I'm curious to see what family bloodlines, if some see it more than others. Yes. And I also will say that uh, for most people, when it comes to like UFO sightings, that happens over and over again. Yes. Like once you see it once, yeah, you're like, oh, and then you get to see more. I mean, like we even yeah. know a guy who's seen strange things on more than one occasion. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. And I know. I know. I absolutely believe him. And I've got one here that you're really going to like. This comes from VG, and it says, "Hello from New Braunfels, Texas." Oh, my fiance and I were watching the stars the other night and saw a translucent manta ray looking creature in the sky. Sounds like what you saw of uh, when you were at Flames. Yeah, pretty close. Except this is one of those that made me think of it. Mine wasn't translucent, but it does make me think of this. And you it said says, it looked like a brown bag or something. Yeah, like a tarp. Saw. Yeah, yeah, moving like a tarp or like a sheet rolling in the winds. Now VG says it was literally swimming gracefully in the sky. We watched it slowly swim from uh, on one side of the sky to the other, and it was cloaked, like you could see it, but it was clear. And it made no sound. And it looked to be, as far as, you know, size, like a plane, but a big plane. We have no idea what this was. We've read up on atmospheric creatures, cryptids, everything, even UFOs. And we still can't really put our finger on what this really was. But it definitely has you rethinking life as you know it. Mm, Yeah, that's interesting. So again, now we've discussed the manta rays and these flying rays and things that you see. And then I remember you and I, and we've not done it on the show, but you and I have discussed it in the past that we've talked about these creatures that live in the upper atmosphere. Yeah, we're going to have to do a show on that. We're going to definitely have to talk about it. Way up high, like the stratosphere. Way up high. So with that, folks, we're going to wrap this thing up, jump to the next side, because I have so much to share with y'all about the great state of Nevada. So when we get back, we're going to dig into some crazy creatures involving Walker Lake, Pyramid Lake. We're going to dig in deep. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. state of nevada most people think of las vegas you could think of area 51 some think of the lovelock caves and the giants you probably don't think of sea monsters (laughs) lake monsters you know things along those lines you don't really think of water (laughs) at least i don't whenever you think of the state of nevada And so digging into the strange and unusual things that I've been finding as I've been going around the the states of America and landing on this state, I never expected to find as much as I did. I thought this would be a rather dry, for lack of a better word, uh, state to have a bunch of really strange things happen. And now I know Area 51's got some wild stuff. 
And of course, there's no telling the amount of haunted hotels and casinos in and around uh, the town of Las Vegas. But I never, never really expected to find the amount of water cryptids that I did. Now, there's a few we've discussed and maybe in passing of hinted at, but I'm going to talk about some really of some of the stranger things. Now, the greatest thing about, I guess, some of the tales coming from Nevada were the Native Americans in this area kept a, a good oral tradition, a good oral history. And the Paiute that we've you know depended on so much for the tales of the giants had a lot of stories that they passed down about a lot of the strange and unusual things that they had seen and came in contact with. And so we're going to start off with uh, an email that was sent into a newspaper from a fella named Joshua Siegel all the way back in 2005. And this is what it says. It says, on Monday, June 27th, 2005, I was driving from Reno, Nevada to Las Vegas, Nevada on U.S. Highway 95. Between the hours of 4 and 5 p.m., my drive brought me to Walker Lake. Noticing that there were no boats on the water and a sign saying private reservation or reserve, I thought this to be pretty weird for such a large lake. Well, come to find out a few miles ahead, you were allowed to launch boats. Well, anyway, as I viewed the lake on my left side with a clear view because my 95 Jeep Wrangler had the soft top windows down, I noticed two birds sitting on the water pretty close to the shore. Now the water's edge was about 200 feet away and the birds were about another 100 foot or so out on the water. What I saw next was unmistakably real as can possibly be. Most people make up these stories or tall tales for attention or whatever, but I know what I saw. I've been trying to research all that I can in regards to what might have been out there, but all I can find is stories about Cecil the Sea Serpent and how I should feed marshmallows to this monster. Seems more like a campfire story than the truth. Well, as I approached the area of these two birds, I noticed the one on the right was all of a sudden gone, grabbed by something under the water without much commotion. The other bird stayed there. No water was splashed. Then this large creature slipped quietly back down into the depths of the water. And I thought at the time, what in the world could have been so large in this lake? No sharks, no whales, no dolphins, no seals live in lakes. So what was it? I'm certain now I saw something similar to the sea serpent legend. This creature slid back into the dark waters hoping no one saw it come out for a snack. The part I saw must have been its mouth and head area, which was gray and round. It measured at least two feet wide and more than eight feet long. I couldn't even see the body entirely, and it slipped back down in the dark waters before it showed its true size. The lower part was much larger than the head or mouth area. The actual size of this thing must have been enormous. As quietly as it had come up from the deep waters, it slipped back with no trace of it ever surfacing, except minus one waterfowl. And I've been thinking about what I saw in Walker Lake nonstop since Monday. Did I really see what I think I saw? And to answer my question, it was yes. I saw something out there, something real during the daytime, and it wasn't a small glimpse or a hoax wasn't magically there and then gone. It didn't vanish into thin air. There is something living in Walker Lake, much larger than any fish. All the internet sites and people I've talked to over the phone seem to point to nothing recently being seen or published regarding Cecil the Sea Serpent or the Sea Serpent legend. Now, you do have something recent. A sighting during daytime by an individual who was sane and sober. According to Joshua, he was saying it's over. And he says, please don't discard this as a hoax or someone misinterpreting what they saw. I saw something in Walker Lake real and alive. And that, like I said, took place in 05. But this story starts 
way before then. I'm talking all the way back into accounts that have found that have been written down by these white settlers that were moving through their either homesteading, of course, I'm sure, you know, on their way to find gold, all the way back into the mid 1800s. And where they had first heard this and came across this when they started noticing and seeing things were the Paiute tribe. And the Paiute tribe that they came across that was native to this area said, and of course the native Paiute tribe, that lake area was in their tribal region. And they told these settlers about what they claimed was a giant snake or snake-like creature in the best that they could explain it that lived in the bottom of that lake and that it would come up and if you were getting water, gathering water, that it may appear and drag one of the natives into the water. And they feared it so much that they refused to go on the lake to fish. They would fish from the bank, but they would not go out onto the lake and fish at all. So you can only imagine where this goes. As more and more of these strange things start taking place, well, it starts spreading. Like a disease, everyone starts getting worked up into a fervor when they think about these things. So there is a letter that's to the editor of the Esmeralda Union, and that was written back in 1868. And there was a person there that said that he and a friend had killed one of these monsters. And this person's name was Reuben Strathers. And Reuben claimed that him and a buddy of his killed this creature that had a head similar to a crocodile. He goes on to say that the front feet was up near its neck and that its tail was extremely long. And he claims that it was covered in scales that would make it shiny when light hit it. Now, I don't find anywhere where you could see, of course, any photos of this, anything, any like. Now, there's drawings, of course, and like we said, more stories about this. But there was more things that came out as you keep going. And one is a prospector tells a story back in 1907. Fella was named Don Cornelson. And him and his buddy John went fishing. Now, this lake's large, folks. So they say that they were roughly a mile from the shore when they spotted this thing. And Don says that at first sight, he said that he took this thing for a man in a skiff. But when it disappeared, he thought that the boat this fellow was, dry, was riding in had fallen over. So instantly he sees the neck. I think it's a man standing. You see it at this distance. Oh, man, the guy fell out. The boat turned over. Let's get over and help him. He starts paddling that way, him and his buddy John. As they start getting there, they realize, well, where's the boat? And then all of a sudden, boom, it comes back out of the water. Not the boat, but this giant neck. And they said what they could tell was they estimated 30 foot in length and six foot wide across its back of this thing that they saw. Now, two years later, there was a railroad worker there attempted to swim from a boat. Just jump in, splash around, didn't want to be out there more, decided I'm going to swim to the shore. Story goes that something came up and grabbed him and drug him underwater and they never found his body. Yeah, fast forward now to the Walker River Bulletin. And there was a writing in there, an article in there in 1915 that claimed that these creatures or whatever it had had disrupted this lake so much it had muddied all the water, all of this stuff, and it was like maybe a breeding season and that it had caused the lake to turn over like almost like a storm had hit it, disturbed it so much. Now, you fast forward again into that, they speak of uh, smoke or fog coming out of the water, laying heavy across the water. Of course, you're going to start throwing these stories out there. People are going to start getting caught up in it, right? You're going to start making more and more stuff. But you jump again into 1934, and someone wrote an article about there being uh, maybe the possibility of, of underground caves. Like some believe that Walker Lake is connected to Pyramid Lake there in Nevada and that these creatures can travel back and forth, back and forth. Now, there's also, like I said, there's tales of uh, these creatures in Pyramid Lake. Like if you start 
looking into that. Pyramid Lake's got, and we're going to get into that, has some really wild stuff that goes on there too. And you ask, what kind of really wild stuff in Pyramid Lake? I'm going to tell you what really wild stuff in Pyramid Lake. Now, like I said, back in the 1800s, before we get to Pyramid Lake, we're still in Walker Lake. Stay with me, folks. Still in Walker Lake. Back still in the 1800s, uh, when when these white explorers and settlers and stuff were coming, of course, they're going out in boats, and that's whenever the natives were telling them, you know, not to do it. That's how this whole thing comes up. There is a tale that was published in 1883 that the Paiutes had told to a, uh, a person, I believe his name was Samuel Pugh. And Samuel Pugh was part of the, uh, the natives there, the Indian agency uh, for Walker River. And he had believed that it was all superstitious, right? Until he had heard some of these stories. And he's told this story that apparently he was, he was told about these. He is going on an expedition himself. So he's told about this story that there may be a monster in this water. So you have to think about this. So he goes down there with these pites, right? And he's like, we're going to, we're going to get to the bottom of this, you know, I don't believe any of this stuff. I hear all these crazy things. I know that there's a lot of, uh, there was a, several steamer ships that were going across this lake that the sailors refused to get on after listening to the natives of the area. So he's like, I'm going to have to go. I can't, I'm trying to be a liaison between the white men and the natives. And this is not working out. I got to go see with my white man. eye. like, oh, I know more than the natives. You know how we get, and we're going to go down there. He goes down there. Story goes, well, he was there. He heard woken up in the middle of the night, an insanely loud shrieking sound. And he says in his tales that they were awakened. It was a full moon night. It was beautiful out there. You could see, you could hear the splashing water. You could hear this thing making some sort of crazy noises. And he could see not one, but two of these creatures and they were fighting in the water. The story goes that the battle carried on for quite some time. And that eventually one of these things ended up on land. I don't know if it was floated or if it was injured and tried to get away. What well, ended up happening? But the story goes that it ends up on land. And when it gets on land, boom, uh, they the natives there killed it and handed over to a alleged white professor there. And that it was studied and looked upon. And they say that they measured this thing out was 79 feet, almost 80 feet. Missed it by just a couple inches in length. That's what they had seen. Now, of course, you don't really know, you know, what we got going on, what it could have been. I can't imagine anything being 80 foot long coming out of a freshwater lake. So like we said, as you jump around, if you jump around again in 1907, there was another professor gone down there and, and he kind of believed that this isn't, this is nothing more than, you know, old wives tales. This is just stuff that they had seen. I don't really know if anybody had ever, how it had ever gone. And, and if anybody had ever really got to study it, but there is a, this one professor in uh, Stanford, it is claimed that uh, he actually got to study it. It's hard to find any writings on them, but if you jump up now, Lauren Coleman uh, found a historical account and Lauren Coleman dug this thing out from 1907 about this. And, and what it is, is the, the title of this newspaper article published says a mining man brings a strange story to Goldfield. And it says a report from Walker Lake states that a monster sea serpent has been seen at the northern end of the lake. And again, here's the Dan Corneliuson you remember the fellow we talked about rowing the boat with his buddy John was a mining man. And he talks about him and his buddy John seeing this reptile while fishing. And they say that they were making their way over to it. And this really goes into more depth than one of the other tales is this goes into saying that not only did it disappear, but it reappeared. But this time in shallowing shallower water near the shore, like it was sunning. So it's like it's laying out like a manatee up by the water. Now, like I said, this was published back in uh, 1907. So they were sure when they got off the water that not only was this thing real, but that this thing was something that the natives had spoken of and it had lived in this lake for many, many, many years. 
And then, of course, now what's funny is you get these reports of it was a giant snake. You also get these reports of it sounds more like Log Ness Monster. It sounds more like, what is it, a plesiosaur. So it's, we don't really know. When you first heard the one that Mr. Siegel uh, sent from 2005, his sighting, to me, his sighting almost sounds like a, uh, a, a giant catfish. You know, like the Welsh catfish or even the large catfish we have over here. If they get big in that body of water, they come up. You can go online and watch fish right now. Largemouth bass eating uh, ducklings. You can also watch catfish eating birds on the water. So there is some things that make you think, man, maybe, maybe there's more to than this than just a giant fish. Also, too, maybe there's not. Maybe there's not any more than it being just a large fish. Now, there are some stories that came from the 1930s that talk about the Mineral County Independent has a thing from the 30s that says numerous tourists and many local residents driving between Hawthorne and the Indian Reservation at Schertz report seeing a huge, wholly unlike any fish monster inhabiting the waters of this lake and swimming about with more than a foot of its body protruding from the water's surface. Respected and responsible citizens stated on their word of honor that such observations had been made. And then also, of course, like I said before, there are tales that the two lakes, the Walker Lake and the Pyramid Lake, are connected. There's even a, a, a tale, I guess you could say a tale, there's actually a writing, a published writing, from the 1930s from a, a, a newspaper called the Mineral County Independent. And there's a little part of there where they say that they believe that there's some underground springs that feed the lake and that it's a common belief that there's an underground outlet. Now, if you look into, like we talked about with this Pyramid Lake and Walker Lake, when you talk about uh, uh, <laughs> Cecil, they believe they could go back and forth, but Pyramid Lake in itself sounds like a place that I'm going to have to go check out. If you're still in Nevada, if you look at Pyramid Lake, for those that, that haven't seen it, look it up. It looks awesome. The water's beautiful. Uh, there's big rock you know, outcroppings coming up out of the water, pyramid-shaped. Now, of course, they're not. You know, It's before as awesome as it would be if it were. It's not, but it's, it, it would be great if there were... Uh, <laughs> ancient pyramids in the middle of the lake that would be amazing but sadly no but there is some stories of what's called water babies now we've discussed this a little bit now these you'll get them i remember hearing stories about these water babies and i'm trying to think about how long ago it's been it's probably been back in 07 or 08 was the first time I remember hearing stories of the water babies. And the first thing I could think of was they sounded like little seaweed covered. Uh, I think of the cartoon Captain Caveman. If you had a little Captain Caveman, but it was seaweed colored. What is that old cartoon Sigmund? And it's Sigmund the sea monster. It reminds me of something along those lines, but it's real. It's small. Like it was little. That's what I always pictured the water babies as. And uh, I don't know why, but that's really not what they were. I've heard stories of both uh, different descriptions, but we're going to get into this whole thing of Pyramid Lake beginning again in the 1800s. Like we talked about, there was a lot of, of Paiute natives because this is part of their, their thing about these water babies and these water babies haunted Pyramid Lake. And so, I, this lake's deep, folks. This lake's like 350 plus foot deep. Like, I'm not sure. I think in the three, you know, there's always lower spots. But I would say between 350 and 370, I would imagine, the depths of the lake. I don't think it's quite 400 foot. But so, there are a couple of stories that go along with these water baby stories that the Paiute would tell. Now, one of them is the fact that it, it kind of sounds like the movie 300 and what the Spartan race used to do. The story goes that if the Paiute had a, a, a baby that was malformed, uh, some sort of deformity, uh, an unhealthy child, a premature, 
something along those lines, that the Paiute would take this baby and cast it into the lake, just toss it off a cliff, and that it would, you know, they would drown. I don't know if they put them in a sack. I don't know, you know, if they, if they just, you know, tied them to a rock. I don't know what they did. But the story, and, and we don't even know that that's what they did. Like I'm saying, this is one of the tales. And the story goes that, that when they, they would do that so that the, the tribe would stay healthy, that they wouldn't introduce this into their tribal life. So, of course, it's heart-wrenching to think of such things, but this is what that they would do. And then the story would go after that, that you could go to the lake and at night you would hear the cries of babies along the lake edge. And it's the ghosts of these, these dead children. Now there's another one that tells, now this is the story that I personally like the most because it tells of a Paiute warrior who spent a lot of time at the lake. Of course, he's fishing, he's doing these things, swimming, and he falls in love with a mermaid that lives in in Pyramid Lake. And that when his tribe found out about this, they of course they're not having it. This is, you know, this is one of those things we're not doing this. And the story goes that the mermaid was so devastated by the fact that this Paiute warrior chose his tribe and they were no longer allowed to be together that she cursed the waters and that she was never allowed to love. And that is the reason that any man that enters what she considers to be her lake is now going to pay the price. So this is the story that goes along with the fact that she kills all these fishermen that when fishermen go out on this lake and they dump their boat and they never are seen again, this is what it is. Some people say that both stories are, are nothing more than a sham and a joke. And, you know, that's, they're just old wives tales. Others say that the Paiute came up with this story and that they tell this story to cover up the fact that they were casting their children into, into the lake, killing, you know, their own children. There is a tale in a book written by a fellow named Richard Marino. And he wrote this book, Mysteries and Legends of Nevada. And in that book, he writes this. Years ago, when I was a reporter at a Reno newspaper, one of my colleagues asked a Pyramid Lake Paiute woman who worked in the circulation department if she had ever considered living on the shores of Pyramid Lake. After all, he said, it was a beautiful lake. And since the land surrounding it was the Paiute Reservation, did she ever think about building a house on the lake to take advantage of the great views? And the woman, in fact, had just built a new home in Nixon, a small community located about six miles south of the lake. She laughed and asked my friend if he were crazy. She said that she had had several small children and that there was no way she would live close to that lake. My friend asked, why? And she responded, because of the water babies that they would come and take my children. So you're thinking right now the same way as I was like, wait a minute, wait, water babies. So that doesn't sound like a mermaid, does it? No, it sounds more like a vengeful spirit or it sounds more like an actual creature. Well, there is another account told by an elder Paiute that says, did my cut this? And this is how it goes. It's actually written in some old papers uh, called the Margaret Wheat Papers. And the story goes like this. Did my cousin tell you about my father? This is from the interviewer. Says that about my father when he was trapping for otter. There used to be otters in this lake a long time ago, and he was trapping for them. Must be way up on the other side of Pyramid, someplace a long time ago. He made a round through his traps, and after a windy day, I guess my father was feeling kind of lazy and decided that uh, he would go get his brother to help him. Said, you go around and look after my traps. Well, I guess my uncle was a real young man. So he said that he was scared of those things and didn't want to mess with them. My father says, well, you go around and make, you know, go ahead and make these rounds yourself. So after the storm, he went around and he had set two of his traps. His traps were all unscrewed and piled up in a little pile. Now, some are kind of riveted, so these nuts won't come off. And they are, of course, riveted together. And he says, my father thinks that some kind of animal must have gotten caught in there 
and spinning around unscrewed these traps because there was blood all over. And when it had first been caught in one of those traps, it must have been going around and round. My father went down to the shoreline, a nice little sandy area there, to wash his hands and said that there were little baby tracks in the sand. Water baby tracks. Now, he used to go around and tell people that you're not going to believe this and no such thing exists as water babies. And he said all that before he had his experience. Now, he goes on to say that this happened a long time before I was born. So all I know is something had to have the strength to take these traps apart and place them in a pile before making its way back into that water. So... We have more Paiute stories of these natives getting involved and dealing with something along the lines of these water babies. Now, what could they be? See, that's the other part of this. It sounds insane. Is what could the water babies actually be? Are they maybe the offspring of this Paiute native and this mermaid woman? Or are they the, I guess, angry, vengeful spirits of the children of the, of the natives cast into this lake? And they are still protecting the creatures of the lake and those around it. And so they are vengeful of, let's say, their their Paiute families for, you know, throwing them out. Uh, also, if you think about this, and there's a lot more we're going to get into. But if you think about this, in Nevada, I remember their stories of Bigfoot uh, escaping Area 51 Uh, There's stories of possible underground sub bases in Nevada, that there are caverns and caves that lead to the sea. There's all these wild tales, but there's a lot of tales of these wild men, you know, much like we said, like Bigfoot around these military encampments in Nevada. So there is a tale from uh, 1879. Uh, This this is interesting about a, a, a some hunters. There were a couple of hunters there and they were hunting in the Antelope Mountains. And the headline reads, a strange creature, two hunters chased by a wild man in the Antelope Mountains. This was published back in 1879. Yeah, that's when this thing was written. So get a load of this. It says November 8th, 1879, William Sheegan, who came in from Antelope Valley last evening with a load of produce, tells a lead reporter a very strange and startling story of the experience of two men who were hunting in Antelope Valley last week. He says that Peter Simmons and John Gore had been out all day hunting ducks and other game as whatever came their way, and as evening came on, they took a shortcut across the mountains on their way back to the ranch. Says the mountain over which the trail led them was a very rugged one. In fact, the wildest place in the Antelope Range of Mountains. And a few years ago, it used to be infested with a larger species of wild animals. And as they were slowly picking their way around the edge of a large large chasm, they heard a slight noise near a rugged cliff and saw a huge, hairy object, apparently half man and half beast, spring from behind a cliff and start for the other side of the mountain, running with the speed of the wind. Mistaking it for a wild animal, one of the hunters, Gore, fired at it. The shot appeared to take effect in the arm, for, with a scream of pain, the creature halted, tapped the wound, and turning, charged its pursuers who, with empty guns in hand, dared not measure strength with such a foe. Dropping their guns, both sought safety in flight and stopped only when compelled to do so from lack of ability to run further. The men say they are positive that the creature resembled a man in general appearance. It was wild-eyed and very fierce in its disposition, judging from the short time they saw it. Mr. Sheegan's story revives a long-forgotten but now distinctively recalled yarn to the effect that many years ago a lunatic Then a young man escaped from his keeper in California and gained the fastness of the Sierra Nevada, where he evaded pursuit and, it is thought, subsisted on the flesh of small animals killed through some means best known to himself. Several months ago, says Sheegan, a strange creature answering this description of the being 
recently seen, with the exception of the grizzly beard, was discovered by a party of men who were hunting on the mountain some 15 miles from Antelope. And it is thought that this may be the same. The hunters say that they are positive that it was no optical illusion, but a genuine wild man and a very fierce one at that. The creature's arms, they say, were long and hairy, and it looked very much like a full-grown gorilla. They uh, say that it ran with remarkable swiftness, all the time uttering loud cries as though in pain and enraged. They declare that it was only by their utmost exertion that they escaped their pursuer, and they say that there was not enough money in Nevada to hire them again to venture across its path. Mr. Sheegan says there is talk of organizing an armed force in Antelope Valley to go in search of this creature. So how wild of a tale is that? But as I leave you with that, it's not the only thing. There was a sighting back in 2005 on a Nevada ranch that goes like this. This is the first time I've ever heard reports of these gargoyles. I saw one back in 2005. I was walking on my grandmother's ranch in rural Nevada. We had no security lights on the property, so I carried a high-powered flashlight with me. I felt a sudden compulsion to turn my head to the, fr to the right. It's the beam from the flashlight in front of my grandmother's chicken coop, and about 15 foot in front of me was an entity about 7 feet tall. It had its back to me. It halfway turned and looked over its left shoulder towards me turned enough that I could see it was definitely male. He had a rather long, bulbous nose, large wings down to about mid-calf, skin and wings that looked leathery, and was a taupe or pinkish color, no hair what that I could see. He also was very thin, almost skeletal in appearance, with some sort of bony protrusions extending from its shoulders. I'll never forget it. It scared the hell out of me. I didn't notice any dead animals in the area afterward, if there were any. So, again, now we have spotted of a wild man running through the mountains of, of uh, Antelope Mountains in Nevada. We have a gargoyle sighting. We know there's water babies there. We know that there's some crazy sea creature there. And now I'm going to leave you this. DJ writes, I have a story that happened to me a while uh, I was driving along a really dark highway in Nevada. I was leaving Las Vegas to go camping for a few days. It was around 1 a.m., and I was driving down State Highway 159 just past Red Rock Canyon, the really beautiful mountainous terrain just outside Nevada. At 1 a.m., there's really nobody else on the road. I happened to be driving down it because I was trying to make up time to make it to my campsite that morning as I had spent a bit too much time in Vegas at some of the shows, if you catch my drift. Now, you also have to realize that there are no street lights here. No light other than the moon and your headlights. That's it. And there are wild horses in this area. Now, I was doing under or around 60 miles an hour trying to make up time. And as I'm driving, I catch movement out of the corner of my eye on the passenger side. It's a two-lane road. So there's no way another car would be driving beside me. I glance over and I see a black figure like some kind of giant cat, but only all black, no fur, just like a giant black shadow as tall as my car running alongside the car. And as I glance, I get this overwhelming fear and feeling of dread and that something in my head keeps telling me if you keep looking at it, it's going to look back and then it's going to come for you. So I quickly look straight forward and go a bit faster. And even at 70 miles an hour, it kept up with me for several more seconds before it simply vanished. My friends all told me that maybe I was at the car. It was just a car shadow. Now, car's shadows don't have a running motion like a giant animal. And I'm not aware of any animal that can run that fast either. I believe it was some kind of spectral cat. I spoke with a friend who lives in Vegas, and he told me people see all kinds of things in these more remote areas of Nevada. Native Americans who live in the area 
say if such things like shapeshifters, skinwalkers, and the overwhelming feeling of dread I felt was a sure sign. And if I had stopped the car or kept looking at it, the thing would have probably tried to knock the car off the road and to get to me. Those folks are just a small portion of the odd and strange things that you can find in the state of Nevada. And we will be digging more into those coming up soon because I've got a whole lot more stuff I want to talk about in Nevada. So I'm going to stop it right here and leave you teased. And I know you're going to be mad and it's okay. I'd be mad too, but we're going to come back from the break and wrap this puppy up. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. And we're back with Expanded Perspectives, uh, talking about the great state of Nevada, man. That has, who knew there were so many strange things going around? I thought Nevada was simply like bodies buried where the mob had them See, whacked. that was me. You know? I didn't know there was near as many lake monsters in Nevada. I had no idea. No, Walker no. Lake has a giant lake monster, water babies and all this. Pyramid Lake, though, I need to go check that out. I remember out. the story. Remember Valiant Thor, the guy that yep. was an extraterrestrial that was friends with like JFK and mm-hmm. stuff, and they have pictures of him. I remember he had a, uh, his UFO was named uh, Victory One, and he used to have it parked at Lake Mead, yep. like under in, in the lake. I remember in that the story. lake. Yeah, in the lake. That's so, pretty cool. Never, and, and there's more. Like I said, I need to get, I'll have to do some more and do another segment or another show uh, about Nevada to wrap it up because there's, so much more. I mean, it's we're gonna have to do every state. I mean, yeah, now you've done I'm, you've done Georgia, you've done Kentucky, yeah, you've now done Nevada. Yeah, we, we need to keep a list and just keep them going. I'll keep. Yeah, I'm gonna keep digging and rolling and going. And you know, in the past, we've covered stuff from different states of Texas and all that. So, I mean, Texas is pretty well done. At least I say that. And we just now get a story from New Bronzeville about some crazy flying manta ray. So, but I mean, you're talking about Nevada spectral cats. That's another thing. There's so much open highway. When you get out into those open, lonesome areas, like when we drove through West Texas going to Arizona, as you're driving out that way, it's there's a lot of spectral things can happen. Mm. You know, it's it's almost like it's I don't know. It, it, it do you zone out? Do you tell I me mean, we didn't see anything crazy? But there's a lot of stuff seen on those old, long, desolate roads. So it could either be your mind, of course, playing tricks on you. Or it could be something like legitly happening out there. Right. I agree. And if you're listening in home and you're thinking, well, wait a minute, I haven't heard you discuss all these states. Well, some of them of those shows are elite shows only. Mm-hmm. So if you're not an elite member, you're missing out on content. Just go to the website, expandedperspectives.com. Click on the elite tab, sign up. You'll be helping out the show by your $5 donation every month. And you'll be getting extra episodes of elite. Every episode we've ever done is there. I'm not even sure how many. I think oh, I around 250 shows. Oh, I got so something a good to share deal. too. Yeah. D- uh, folks, if you're interested in hearing me flap my lips about some crazy bow hunting stories and involved in that, make sure you jump on Facebook. If you're going to be listening to this, hopefully it'll be this Friday. What is this Friday's date? The 24th. The 24th. It's going to be the Friday, the 24th of April. 6 p.m. on Facebook, 6 p.m. Central Time on Facebook. You got to go to the to the podcast page of the stick bow chronicles my buddy rob patuto has asked me to come on that podcast and if you're into hunting and bow hunting and traditional archery rob's the man he's the man to talk to dude it's a great show he talks to everybody how i got lucky to be on here i have no idea but we're going to be doing a live stream this friday at six central on Facebook. So if you want to jump on there and ask questions and basically watch me tell stories about crazy old pig attacks and all kinds of stuff like that, that's where I'll be. That's going to be awesome. I got a quick story before we get Lay out of here. Lay it on me. Yes. This is a short one sent to us from a guy named Barry. 
And he claims that this took place in Canton, Ohio, back in 1986. Cam, I think you're going to like this. It says, my grandfather passed away in the mid-1980s. So we sold his vehicle as we were selling some of his other possessions. My mother and grandmother signed the title over to the new owner, and they came to pick up the vehicle. However, when they came, they couldn't find the car keys anywhere. The house was searched from top to bottom in every drawer, in every closet, in every shelf, and every table was looked into, and they could not find the keys anywhere. It was nowhere to be found. Anyways, a few days later, my mother arrived at my grandma's house and found her to be distraught. My mother asked her what was wrong, and she would only reply that she had found the car keys. Well, my mother was happy to hear the news, and she asked, well, where were they? My grandmother replied, they were on the bathroom floor, in the middle of the bathroom. Now, we certainly would have found them quickly if they had been there days earlier. It seems like Grandpa didn't want us to sell his car. Wow. Now, we've talked about stuff like that. I don't know if it was specifically missing keys, but I know we've talked about on this show, like, what is it? I don't know if it's a time slip, but things go missing, and you'll look in a drawer, and it won't be there, and you'll go look other places. You'll look in the same drawer again. won't be there. You'll go look a couple other places, and then you'll look in that drawer later or maybe another day later, and it'll be there again. I mean, you know, that type of thing happens. These like lo- little everybody I think has lost an item, and then it'll be there. Yep, yep. And you can't explain it because you're like, dude, I know it was there. I've even had things that were like tethered or tied off somewhere. Yes, and it won't be there, and then I'll find it there. I'd be like, man, I know I looked. And it makes you feel like you're losing your mind. It does. It does. Uh, I always think back, and you and I have discussed it. Whenever we had that, uh, uh, what was it, the football or whatever it was that fell out of nowhere at your house? Yeah. Just literally out of nowhere. We heard a noise, <laughs> and it like bounced off those those what were they bookshelves in, yeah. the, in that big rec room we had. Yeah, <laughs> we were like, "Where did that come from?" Dude. Nobody had been throwing it. Nothing was up on top because you could see up on top. It just appeared. Yeah, yeah. So it's that wacky. Things like that yeah. happen. Uh, don't forget, coming up on May second, we're going to be doing another live stream. Yep. We talked about this on the Elite Show, but uh, for you. Listeners of Just Expanded Perspectives. Yep, we're going to be doing another live stream on YouTube. I know a lot of people missed the first one we did, which is okay because we didn't know what we were doing anyways. We still don't, but maybe we'll try a little bit. Right, but if you would like to join in on that, it's going to be at like 4 p.m. Central Standard Time, May 2nd. It's a Saturday. Uh, If you have any questions you would like answered on that live stream, you can start sending those emails now. Yeah. Just put in the title or whatever uh, live stream question. Uh, send it to expanded perspectives at yahoo.com and we'll try to answer your question on that live stream. You can also tune in live. You can be there in the chat room, shoot us questions just like we did last time. Yep. Uh, I think it's, and we're going to, and we're going to try to do like a monthly wrap up of what we discussed this month, but we may just be sitting there doing Q and a the whole time. I don't know. And if any of you listening are from any of the States that I have recently covered and you have some interesting stories or whatnot, make sure to send them and we'll cover those on the live stream. Yep. We'll discuss all that on the live stream too. So we hope if anyone from Nevada or from uh, Georgia or Kentucky jump in there. Yeah. We want to hear some crazy encounters and send us some messages and that's the way it's going to go. Yeah. Just title it uh, live yeah. stream questions Perfect. or live stream wrap up or whatever you want. Uh, Mary will forward all that stuff to us. Uh, don't forget about expanded perspectives elite. Like I mentioned a few moments ago, signing up is easy Go over to the website, expanded perspectives.com. Click on the elite tab. It's $5 a month. You get access to extra shows. If you have any stories you'd like to share with me and Cam, email the show. Same email, expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. You can follow me and Cam on all forms of social media. Help everybody out there stay safe. Wash your hands, folks. Keep your distance more than six feet apart. No groups larger than 10. Till next time, I'm Kyle Filson. He's Cam Hale. Peace, y'all.